I'm going to call this meeting to order of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District on September 22nd, 2022 uh, at uh, 9.05 a.m. Um, if the clerk could please call the roll to establish a quorum. Director Aquino. Director Daniels. Here. Director Desmond. Director Frost. Here. Chair Guetta. Here. Director Harris. Director Kennedy. Here. Director Lalowi. Here. Director Natoli. Director Papineau. Here. Director Serna. Director Singh Allen. Here. Director Terry. Here. Director Vang. We have a quorum. Great, thank you, Madam Clerk. If uh, those can please stand and join me uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance, find a flag that in your household. Salute, pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, of America and to the Republic for which it stands, which stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty and justice. And justice for all. Thanks everyone. Madam Clerk, if you could please read the board announcements. In compliance with directives of the State and Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the physical location of this meeting is close, cap close to the public, consistent with state and local officials' recommendation to promote social distancing and Assembly Bill 361. Members of the public are encouraged to participate in the meeting by observing the meeting in real time at metro14live.seccounty.gov, Zoom video conference, conference line, and by submitting written comments electronically by email at boardclerk at airquality.org. Comments submitted in person will be delivered to the Board of Directors by staff. Public comments regarding matters under the jurisdiction of the Board of Directors will be acknowledged by the chairperson and accepted until the adjournment of the meeting, distributed to the Board of Directors, and included in the record. This meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District is cablecast live without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T UVerse cable system. This meeting is being closed captioned and will be webcast at metro14live.sacccounty.gov. Today's meeting will be repeated on Saturday, September 24th, 2022 at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, uh, uh, members, uh, we've got a tight quorum today, but we also have our assembly member here, McCarty, joining us. So what we're going to do here is we're going to quickly go through, uh, let's dispense with the consent calendar, and then we'll go to assembly member McCarty before we do our air pollution control officers report. And maybe uh, Director Ayala, if you could introduce Mr. McCarty um, at that point. So Madam Clerk, if uh, uh, first item on the agenda is our consent calendar. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Good. Um, members, uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any members of the public signed up to speak on uh, on the consent calendar? No, Chair, we do not. Thank you very much. Let me bring this back Move to the approval board. Move approval. Thank you. Uh, it's been moved by Director Daniels. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by Director Papanue. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none. Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll on the consent calendar. Director Kina, Director Daniels, Director yep. Desmond, Director Frost. Aye. Chair Guetta. Aye. Director Harris. Director Kennedy. Aye. Director Lalowi. Aye. Dr Director Natoli. Director Papineau. Aye. Director Serna. Director Terry. Aye. Director Singh Allen. Director Singh Allen, you still on the line? I don't see her on there. Madam Chair, if we can keep the roll open on that, and let's go ahead and go with uh, our um, uh, our speaker, and then if uh, uh, Mayor Singh Allen comes back, we can add her to the roll. Okay, sounds good. We need good her morning, vote uh, item to pass. Yes. Good morning, Chair Guetta. This is Jamil Moons. Um, I'm actually 
stepping in for our APCO, Alberto Ayala, today. He's traveling, and so um, it is my pleasure to sit here this morning uh, with you. Let's go ahead, and as you suggested, let's move to the discussion calendar. The first item on the discussion calendar, which our uh, Assemblymember McCarty is, is here, and I'm going to go ahead and pass that honor of introducing him to Amy Roberts, who will be uh, taking this item, if that's okay with the chair. No, thank you very much. Ms. Roberts. Morning, Chair Gara, members of the board. Uh, if we'd like to um, go ahead, I will introduce um, Assemblymember McCarty. Um, we'll be today talking to you about our wildfire smoke air pollution emergency plan. And uh, this was the plan that was developed under Assembly Bill 661. Um, and again, I'll introduce myself. I'm the division manager for the stationary source division here at the district. Uh, Selena, next slide, please. All right, um, so before I provide the overview of the plan, um, we do have two um, important guest speakers here. We do have our, the author of AB661, Assembly Member Kevin McCarty, and our Sacramento County Public Health Officer, Dr. Olivia Casirier. It was Assembly Member McCarty's upfront work to get AB661 passed by the legislature that started our journey here at the district and propelled us to action. So Assembly Member McCarty, I think it's safe to say that you are the person that started it all for us. So let me go ahead and turn it over to you first for your comments. Thank you. Can you all hear me right here? Yes, good morning. Uh, okay, so. good morning. I'm on the phone. Excuse me, I have some technical issues. Um, uh, really, I just want to say out of the gate that, um, you know, this started for me, frankly, with my experience working with you all. I was a member of the um, Air District for uh, several years when I was on the city council for uh, a decade. So I appreciated my time and the fabulous staff. Who, who work there and um, and all of you who's come from your regional bodies to participate in this. So thank you um, for your service. And so, uh, yeah, in 2018, as we remember, we had, you know, one of our many um, falls with very, very uh, dangerous uh, wildfires to the north of California. And a couple of those days, we had the worst air quality in the world. And uh, there was a lot of confusion with some schools um, being open, some schools being closed, some employers say go to work, some, you know, the, the tra public transportation uh, uh, messages as well. So a lot of confusion. And I saw that firsthand. We have kids in school. And so after talking with um, your leadership there with uh, Dr. Ayala and others, we said, hey, we need to come up with a, a better plan to focus on what to do when we have these events. And so uh, that was the uh, genesis for AB661. I think I you know, worked in the board chair was um, uh, Steve Hansen, or somehow he was really involved with the crafting of this. And so we decided to author legislation and you were the sponsors of it. And really uh, thank you for doing the work the past uh, couple of years to make this reality. The bill was signed into law and you know, and we saw just a few weeks ago with the mosquito fire and potentially having some of the winds uh, pushing the smoke down here. That didn't quite happen. We were fortunate, but this issue is not going away <clears throat> with um, extreme heat and uh, the impact of climate change and wildfires. So we need to make sure we have policies in place to what to do when we have these unfortunate events. So uh, thank you for, for making this a reality and uh, I'll let you get on with your work this morning. I just want to say, uh, good morning, hello, and appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Assembly Member. Appreciate your comments today and the great work. And I do want to also acknowledge our former uh, chair, uh, Steve Hansen, who um, who brought this uh, to the attention to make sure that it was state law and that other, other districts throughout the state would follow suit as well. Ms. Roberts. Thank you, Assembly Member McCarty. Thank you, Chair Guerra. And next, we'll hear from Dr. Kasirier. Dr. Kasiri and her team were our collaborating partner in developing the plan, and they provided important public health guidance um, for what's in the plan. So let me turn it over to you, Dr. Kasiri, for your remarks. Dr. Dr. Kisiri, if you can hear me, uh, at least on my end, I'm I'm hearing a lot of delay on your sound. I'm having some difficulties as well. Uh, 
inspection and, and Dr. Kaziri, uh, we can't, uh, unfortunately, we can't hear you at the moment. Be able to say a few words. I'm really happy to join today. Uh, just the adoption what we're the hearing is a is a delay in in what she's already said um even though she's muted it's still coming through ah thank you carlos appreciate that if someone could send a quick note to dr casirie and and uh let her know that uh uh if she logs off and logs back on and uh, we'll we'll bring her back on when appropriate yes uh, let's, uh, uh, chair gara um she did ask me to uh to continue for her um Excuse the interruption. I, I'm I am with a, a planner with um, public health emergency preparedness, and um, so I'm here as as sort of backup. So um, happy to be here um, and uh, join the board, Chair Guerra, and the members of the board um, uh, for the meeting today and for the adoption of the wildfire smoke air pollution emergency plan. Um, as was mentioned earlier in 2018, many of you will recall the unprecedented moment our agencies were all confronted with uh, day after day of unhealthy and hazardous smoke conditions that were affecting everyone in our county, especially school children and those living and working outdoors. Uh, it was apparent then that our agencies would benefit from additional coordination and tools to help improve the public's health during such events. Most recently, we experienced air quality effects of the ongoing mosquito fire, which began earlier this month. The adoption of this plan is an important milestone for Sacramento County and provides us with valuable resources for a better response to smoke events. As a coordinating partner in the plans development, we have been able to observe the work that went into creating the emergency plan and appreciate the effort put forth by district staff to coordinate and prepare the plan and other useful tools. There were many meetings and drafts that went on in the background to develop what you see today. Uh, I am, and certainly Dr. Kassiri is happy to see the results of the work that went into the plan and feel that we are much better prepared for smoke events when they happen. Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. Kassiri. I just managed to log on. My apologies. Um, as I was mentioning, I am doing a jail inspection, so not in my office. So. Uh, I guess the iPad volume was not good, but I do appreciate the opportunity uh, to be able to make a few comments. And I did hear the tail end of what uh, one of our staff was able to uh, provide to you. So very appreciative of the collaboration that we have and um, looking forward to being able to implement this. And we actually had the opportunity to implement this with the last um, smoke event that we had. And uh, everyone appreciated that it went a lot smoother. So I believe that this plan prepares us better. So thank you again for the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you very much, Dr. Kassiri. We appreciate you and your staff at the county uh, uh, public health office here for that all that effort. Ms. Roberts. And I'll also say thank you to Dr. Kassiri. It was it was a tremendous pleasure to get to work with you and your team. Thank you so much for your contributions. All right, uh, now let me go ahead and give you more details on the emergency plan itself. Next slide, please, Selena. Selena, if you can move to the next slide. Are you able to see the presentation, Amy? One just prior. Thank you, I see it now. Okay, so um, as you heard um, from both uh, Assembly Member McCarty and, uh, and Dr. Casirier and, and Carlos from Public Health, um, AB 661 was adopted in October, 2019 in response to the, the severe smoke episodes we experienced in 2018. And it was our legislative mandate for the Air District to create a wildfire smoke air pollution emergency plan. And this also AB 661 required the California Air Resources Board to assess wildfire smoke emergency response programs, not just in our district, but throughout the state and provide this information to the legislature. Next slide, please. 
Now you see here the district worked with numerous partners and stakeholders during the plan development to make sure that the plan represented local entity perspectives. We had a working group that we convened early in 2020. Uh, you can go back to that year and, and think that um, progress was quickly derailed on, on the path that we had set uh, with the onset of the pandemic. So while public health and school districts, businesses, and all of us were grappling with the challenges of that time, we, uh, by necessity, um, adjusted our expectations, and we continued to develop the plan just at a revised time frame. So through it all, our partners all deserve a lot of credit for still participating, still providing us with their feedback and the review. And I'd like to, again, thank and highlight the assistance of our partner, um, Breed California. They provided um, uh, input into our plans development. They were brought in early on to help with logistics and planning and uh, developing some of our outreach tools and we're very appreciative of their partnership in this. Let me go ahead and give you a short overview of the final emergency plan itself, which is also included in your packet for you to view. Next slide, please. So the emergency plan is broken down basically into several main sections. They're all color coded to help anybody who's looking at the plan. The first section gives some basic air quality 101 information related to health impacts from smoke, how we monitor, how we forecast air quality, and that kind of information. The report then goes into the um, four main sections that were required to be addressed by legislation. And the plan also highlights those key tools and resources um, that we developed. These include action charts and resource links. I'll, I'll get into some of that a little bit later. But the plan is really geared towards four main sectors that we felt were most in need of having these ready-made tools. So our schools, the general public, our local government entities, and our business sector. Next slide, please. So here you can see um, the four main elements that I mentioned that were the core of AB661, and therefore uh, we made sure that they made up the bulk of the emergency plan. Those were the health protective recommendations, making sure that everybody knew who the responsible agencies and actions were, our recommendations for businesses and public agencies, and also strategies for vulnerable populations. So each section you can go in and there's additional detail on all of those areas for what to do prior to and during a smoke event. And it also addresses um, best practices for mask usage, which was also um, more of a confusing point in 2018 that we hope to clarify with this plan. Uh, in that last element, you'll also be able to see a segment that summarizes some of the key challenges that our cities and county face when smoke is here in the county and they're trying to provide services um, to our, our vulnerable populations and grappling with the limited resources that they have. Next slide, please. Okay, the emergency plan you can say was the official assignment that we had, but I think it's worth noting uh, some uh, and highlighting for you the other key outcomes that came out of, from that plan development and that process. These were the science-based approaches that we incorporated into the plan, the tools and the resources that we developed, and the enhancement to our coordination and collaboration in the county. Next slide, please. So the first key outcome is the targeted approach we use to make sure the emergency plan had a scientific and data-driven foundation to it. One of the unique methods used was an online survey sent to approximately 100 local businesses, nonprofits, and public agency representatives. We really wanted to find out how they responded to wildfire smoke, what challenges they faced, and how they could reduce employee exposure to smoke. So those re results really confirmed for us that yes, indeed, most of our businesses, most of our agencies were greatly impacted during um, smoke events. And also it was nice to see that they were valid, had taken steps in the past and were willing to take additional steps in the future to reduce exposure, exposure uh, to their employees. The survey also corroborated that the tools that were being created were sought after and that the emergency plan would be useful to them. So during the past two years, we also benefited from collaborative work done outside of our agencies, um, outside of the district. It was work done by the Office of Health Hazard Assessment and the California Air Pollution Control Officers Association that helped us address whether or not a short-term air quality metric uh, was needed to be able to give more health protective recommendations during fast changing wildfire smoke conditions. Their review and assessment of the latest research confirmed that our current AQI that we use is that based on an averaged air quality measurement over a 24-hour period is sufficiently protective. Also, 
our air quality partners at the federal EPA also along the way provided us with a very useful tool that allows us to see air quality at a much more granular level by incorporated corrected portable air sensor data along with our regulatory monitoring air data onto one map. This really has been a game changer in terms of assessing what actions to take based on a very local look at air quality conditions. So let me go ahead and show you a visual of that uh, fire and smoke map now. Next slide, please. You can see on this map, and hopefully most of you have, have been going here anyways, but this is the color-coded air quality data that you see in the region during a smoke event. Uh, this happened to be the Caldor fire from last year. The map also provides uh, a lot of other use useful information, that smoke plume visualization, fire information, or you can look at the trends and historical conditions, all are really helpful in making decisions, and again, at that local level. So very quickly, if you're a school or a business or anybody, a member of the public, you can assess if you should take action and reduce your exposure. Next slide, please. All right, so let me go ahead and go into the second outcome, uh, key outcome of the emergency plan. This was the creation of the various tools and resources that can be used by all of our target sectors. It's really the go-to, it's the easy, um, um, place to go to get the, the information. You can imagine that 50 page re report and that emergency plan isn't really the place that people are gonna go and flip through when they wanna know uh, when smoke is in our area, what to do. So the website and all of these resources serve as our quick reference material for, for more responsive action. Uh, this dedicated wildfire smoke information page, you can link to it from our homepage and you'll find a, a lot of useful flyers, action charts, videos, and other links to information and an outreach toolkit. Let me go ahead and give you some high level um, preview of some of these items. Next slide, please. Right here, you can see several flyers that were created. There's a five-step guide that will quick, quickly walk anybody through um, the main steps that we think are important to take during a smoke event. There's a contact guide, again, for quick reference of um, online services and phone numbers of who to call for public health and air quality. And there's also the last flyer on the right. It's great for anybody to promote uh, what kind of action should be reduced when smoke is in the area. And we, we really don't wanna put any more particular particulate matter pollution into the air. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, this chart is an example of what we call an air quality action chart. These charts are designed to help entities make decisions for various activities at different AQI levels. This chart that you see in front of you is specifically for school districts and it was built on work that was done by other agencies throughout the state. And what we did is also create one for public agencies, for the general public and for businesses. So each of those sectors have specific recommendations for different air quality levels for them to reference and go to. This was one of the unique features of our response tools and one that has garnered attention from other air districts. Next slide, please. Our communications team also created a, a really youthful wildfire smoke partner toolkit that's available online. Makes it really easy for our local government schools and businesses to send out standardized messages. Within the toolkit, you'll find ready-made Twitter and Facebook posts and newsletter templates that really facilitate getting out health protective information out quickly. And it was all part of the overall strategy to improve the county's readiness and response and to facilitate simple and consistent messaging. This tool, along with the other resources, all play a key role in local awareness and response and why I consider these to be the second key outcome of the emergency plan. Let me go ahead and move on to the last and equally important outcome, our countywide coordination and collaboration. Next slide, please. I previously highlighted for you all of our many partners and stakeholders that were engaged in the process. The online survey and working group meetings provided input and feedback on the various elements throughout the tool or throughout the plan. And uh, very importantly, this engagement helped establish new relationships and understandings amongst our district and our response agencies, our public health officer, city and county governments, and our schools. So we now have a contact list at the ready so we can quickly reach out to our partners about wildfire smoke conditions, funding opportunities related to wildfire smoke, for example, and a communication plan is in place that really helps organization leadership know where to go and who to call during smoky conditions. Next slide, please. So if you've already heard a couple of times, 
that wildfires did not wait while the emergency plan was under development. We've had three significant wildfire seasons, including this year with the Smith, uh, mosquito fire. These events did uh, afford us an opportunity though to refine our communication approach. So it was a, a good time for us to test the gaps in our response protocols based on those real smoke events. And I can say that we're definitely better now prepared at coordinating with our partners and we're now poised even more to provide uh, additional resources with our website and our quick um, response tools and templates. Next slide, please. As we conclude the last steps for the emergency plan that are required under AB 661, we definitely don't wanna put this plan on the virtual shelf. It'll be posted online, but our goal is to continue to work with our partner agencies and our communities before and during wildfire smoke events because we, we really wanna make sure that everybody's aware of how to access health and air quality information on wildfire smoke and how to use the tools and resources available. So when smoke does come our way again in the future, our district team will be ready to work with agencies in Sacramento to promptly respond. Next slide, please. Okay, here's a quick look at the remaining steps for completing the wildfire smoke air pollution emergency plan. And our request today for you to adopt the plan providing the report to the legislature. And as I just mentioned, continuing our work to inform and train various sectors on the available tools and resources. And because wildfire preparedness and response is so important and remains a high interest topic throughout the state and the nation, we'll continue to engage with our stakeholders locally at the state and at the federal levels and, and all the air agencies to share the plan and our process to best coordinate our efforts. Next slide, please. So today we are requesting action from the board that is to adopt a resolution approving the wildfire smoke air pollution emergency plan for Sacramento. Adoption of the plan for AB 661 is required for the district to be eligible to receive any future funding that may come available to cover the costs which were extensive um, associated with implementing the plan. It's also recognition of the substantial time and effort district staff and partner agencies put forward to develop the plan. So before you consider the resolution, I would like to take just one more moment to say thank you again to all of those that put time into the plan development and to especially highlight the work again of Breathe California, in particular, Stacey Springer, Patrick Guild, and Nicole Brady, and district staff, Mark Lautzenheiser, Janice Lamsnyder, and our great communications team, Jamie Arno and Emily Allshouse. I'd also like to say thank you to Dr. Ayala for his support, his guidance, and keen interest in the plan's development. He's not here today, but I just wanted to acknowledge him because of his substantial input into it. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Guerra, and I'm ready to answer any questions you or other members may have. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much, Ms. Roberts. First, let me go to the clerk here. Madam Clerk, do we have any members of the public signed up to speak on this item? No, Chair, uh, Chair Guerra, we do not. Great, thank you very much. Well, then let me bring this back to the board here. Uh, are there any questions from the board? And um, uh, if not, then uh, I know uh, uh, board member Singh Allen will be joining us here again for the vote, but I did wanna one, uh, also uh, share my uh, acknowledgement and support for uh, all of the staff that, that put this together. This was a, a very significant undertaking by um, the Air District, the County, our uh, Clean Air Partners to be able to do this. And if uh, those that remember and recall the, the sheer confusion about what uh, what to do, what the schools were doing, what was safe for, for families, um, you know, which entity was going to speak out and communicate. And in that time frame, we've been able to have a great and rapid response in multiple languages every time there um, has been a smoke incident um, in our area. And even in preparation, people know where to look now. Um, they know that they can see what, what the, uh, when we had the mosquito fire, people were, our, our constituents were looking to see what the outcome was going to be. So uh, kudos to everyone there. Uh, I will say though, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Roberts, but this took about about 800 staff hours uh, in combination to do because of the, all of our different partners that have to communicate to set this plan, emergency plan up. Yes, that that is accurate. It was 800 plus hours and and counting. Yes. Well, very good. And and I think there lies the the point that uh, while this was great, I'm glad we did it. We needed to do it. Uh, uh, though I I think. Uh, Assemblymember McCarty might already have jumped off. Um, you know, I, I would be remiss if I if I didn't say that 
while the plan allows us to, to access future funding and, and recruit fundings for implementation, um, yet another uh, mandate that didn't uh, provide the staff support and funding for us uh, that already competes with our exposure reduction fund. So uh, just uh, I'd be remiss as chair if I didn't call that out and ask that, um, you know, uh, that our our, uh, our state leaders also consider that in, in uh, when drafting um, uh, legislation uh, to implement these issues. So uh, we know we had to do it and I appreciate the leadership of our staff to do it. So thank you all for being able to do that. Uh, but let me bring this back to the board for an action. Chair Getham, before we move on this item, can I please get Director uh, Singh Allen's vote on the consent calendar? Oh, let me see. Uh, Mayor she's Singh she's on the line. Okay, uh, well, let's, uh, before we uh, take an action on this. Yes, you... I'm back. Very good. Uh, Madam Clerk. Right. I'll vote on this consent calendar, Mayor Singh Allen. Yes. Okay. Great. Very good. So the consent calendar passes. Very good. Let me bring this up. Uh, motion Thank you. On the uh, on the action item here. I'll move the item, Terry. Second, moved, Frost. Has been moved by Board Member Terry, seconded by Board Member Frost. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Director Aquino. Director Daniels. Director Daniels, are you on the line? I think you're muted. Aye. Thank you. Director Desmond. Director Frost. Aye. Chair Guetta. Aye. Director Harris. Director Kennedy. Aye. Director Lalowi. Aye. Director Natoli. Director Papineau. Aye. Director Serna. Director Sing Allen. Aye. Director Terry? Aye. Director Vang? This item passes. Very much. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Jamil, are you uh, going to do the air pollution control officer's report? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, we can go ahead and do that. Selena, we have uh, just a very brief slide and then a special uh, video to share with you. So as she's pulling that up, we just wanted to uh, remind you that Clean Air Day is Wednesday, October 5th, and we're very excited about that day. Obviously, it's a day to promote clean air. Um, there will be a press conference at 39th Street and UC Davis Health Light Rail Station at 10 a.m., and our chair, Chaguera, will be there uh, making remarks representing the district, and I will also be attending um, that event. Scooter, our Spare the Air mascot, will also be there for photo op opportunities. And um, that's always a lot of fun when Scooter's out of these events. On that day, we also have free rides on SACRT. So that's a, a great uh, contribution that SACRT is making to Clean Air Day. And so we just invite you to encourage your constituents to take the Clean Air Pledge. Uh, if you would like more information about that, there is a social media kit available at apcocleanairday.org. Um, secondly, what I just wanted to share, it's a very brief report, again, just reiterating, um, Dr. Ayala is, is not able to be present today, so I'm, I'm very happy to, to share it. It's, it's uh, very brief, and he will, I'm sure you will hear much more from him next, next month on his air pollution control officer's report, but today we just wanted to share with you a very special video. Um, it's debuting here with this board. We're excited about that. It's a tool um, to educate a variety of different audience about the district's history, um, our programs, the leadership in the region that we, we play, as well as the vision for our future. It will be available on the district's YouTube channel. It'll be posted on our website at airquality.org and can be used in community meetings um, and during district sponsored events and conferences. So unless there are any questions, Chagueta, I also want to just Say we have been having a little bit of technical difficulty, I think, with bandwidth. Some people seem to see the video fine. Others, there's a bit of a lag. Uh, hopefully, the audio at least will, will flow smoothly. Um, if we have too much of a hiccups, uh, Chair Geta, perhaps you can just raise your hand and say, let's move on. But it is, it's a four-minute video. It's it's brief, but we would love to share that with you if that's, uh, if that's your wish. Yes, before I do that, let me bring this over to Supervisor Kennedy here. Board Thank member, you. Vice Chair Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify the free rides for RT are actually that entire week. So it's 10-1 through 10-7. Uh, 
Fantastic. Thank you for that correction. I, I was not aware of that. I'm ex uh, excited to hear that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yes, let's go ahead and get going. And if we run into technical difficulties, we're going to be sending this video out to everyone anyways, uh, so that we can encourage folks to learn more about uh, the Air District and uh, the good work we're trying to do. Prior to the early 1950s, industrial pollution, auto emissions, and residential burning were not regulated in California, with smog levels continuing to worsen and negative health impacts significantly increasing, air pollution control districts were formed to monitor and manage air quality. Because of California's unique landscapes and diverse communities, regional air quality entities were required to address the varying challenges and needs related to air pollution and achieve air quality goals across the state. The Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District was established in 1959 and is leading the region toward a low carbon future. While the district's jurisdiction includes Sacramento County, seven cities, the unincorporated areas of the county, and a population of over 1.5 million, its reach and influence extends throughout the Sacramento region thanks to the district's leadership in planning efforts and developing innovative new air quality improvement projects. The district continually monitors air pollution, coordinates programs to educate residents about regional air quality, and alerts the public when levels are forecast to be unhealthy, all with the goal of reducing exposure to residents. And with a robust enforcement program, the district regularly inspects our regulated sources to ensure compliance and assist them in fulfilling their permit conditions. In addition, our inspectors enforced Check Before You Burn, our Sacramento County Wintertime Fireplace Curtailment Program, which prohibits residential fire burning when particle pollution is forecast to be elevated, in an effort to reduce particulate matter air pollution and the associated health risks. The Sacramento Air District, in partnership with the Air Districts of the Sacramento Region, is proud to lead the development, funding, and implementation of a wide range of sustainable clean air initiatives and investments to help our broader community adapt to a changing climate and improve the public health and livability of our region. The district is leading the Sacramento region and the nation by pioneering innovative efforts to address these vital issues. We have developed projects to support the electrification of transportation and replace older polluting equipment with cleaner low emission trucks, buses, tractors, ag pumps and locomotives, created community-based mobile incentive programs to benefit the health of residents living in low-income, disadvantaged communities, and incentivized the largest deployment of electric school buses in North America. Other efforts to bring zero and near-zero emission mobility options to the region include electric transit shuttles, on-demand microtransit, electric vehicle infrastructure, and active transportation options such as electric bikes and scooters. The district is also supporting ongoing efforts to increase sustainable development in our region, including all electric housing and buildings to decarbonize our society. The district has a number of air monitoring sites throughout the county and is working with numerous community partners to deploy portable sensors into neighborhoods that have historically been disproportionately affected by air pollution to collect and analyze data on a hyper-local level with the goal of reducing impacts on our most vulnerable communities. Members of these communities are also engaging with the district to create and promote innovative solutions to decarbonize our community, ensuring every resident enjoys the benefits of a green economy and a low carbon future. As we continue our mission of achieving clean air and a low carbon future for all, we are committed to developing, implementing, and supporting new renewable energy technologies that will reduce carbon production throughout our region. Working with our partners, we will bring clean mobility options to our region, advance sustainable development efforts, and continue to achieve air quality standards. To learn more about the SAC Metro Air District and our programs and initiatives, please visit www.airquality.org. Without a hitch, look at that. That's just tells you the level of great work that our air district is doing in all forms. Um, wanted to just thank again. That was just an impressive video. I mean, the number of work. I, I want to thank our board members too. Many of you have been deeply engaged in you know uh, how effective we can be, how prudent we can be with our resources, and uh, and just lead the, the the country in this effort. So um, I want to thank everyone and thank our staff for that. Um, 
Jamil. Yes, thank you. That does conclude uh, the Air Pollution Control Officer report for this morning. Um, I would recommend we move back to the discussion calendar where we have uh, an additional item to finish up the meeting. Very good. Okay, Madam Clerk. Okay, um, discussion on the dis discussion calendar, item number eight, the California State Budget and Funding Opportunities. And I have Jaime Lemos on the line to start our presentation. Good morning, Chair Guerra and members of the board. Um, we actually have two items, but they we, we split these up, uh, one to address the state of California budget and funding opportunities, and then also one to address our local solicitations for the Air District and what this means for your constituents and for the community as we put out solicit a solicitation on incentives, and, um, and then that way we can get funding flowing to our community members. Um, go ahead to the next slide, please. So this morning, uh, let's first address the uh, state of California budget and uh, some legislation that will be passing or that has passed. And so this morning I have Amy Brown with ARC Strategies who, who ARC Strategies is our legisla legislative advocate for, for our agency. Good morning, thanks for having me again. It's always great to, to see everyone and, and speak to uh, your board members. So let's, um, before we go to the first, slide, uh, I kind of want to give a high level on this, you know, monumental budget that the state um, passed over June, and then they did some follow up with allocations in August, we call those budget junior bills. But let me just tell you big, uh, big picture. It was a $300 billion state budget um, with a $100 billion surplus. I, I've been doing this for almost 25 years. I've never seen a budget surplus quite this big. But 236 billion were spent in general fund and 38 uh, billion in special funds. There was about a, a little over 20 billion for the climate change package. If you've been watching the news, you've seen um, the governor sign uh, sort of the five pillars uh, of, of a bill package that. Um, aimed to uh, uh, prevent the climate change that we're facing. I will also mention to their um, tax refunds. You, you may have noticed this was highly controversial and debated between the legislative leaders and the governor um, to offset the high uh, price of gas. So what they landed on, I'm sure you guys are all aware of this, was a tax refund for about 20 million Californians who make $75,000 a year or less. And, you know, it's anywhere between $200 uh, dollars up to $1,050 in, in a one-time check that people should be receiving. So let's go to the first slide and drill down on some of the issues that um, we've been uh, dealing with. So, you know, the Carl Moyer incentive program was set to expire, uh, you know, the AB8 Clean Air Programs funding extension. So what happened was we, we worked with legislative leaders. We worked with actually assembly member Eduardo Garcia, who um, is from the Coachella Valley. He authored the bill, AB2836, that extends the various fees that support Carl Moyer for 10 years, so until 2034. Um, the governor has signed it. So when we developed this uh, PowerPoint, uh, we were still awaiting signature. So that has been signed. What we, um, you know, effectively did during those discussions was look at ways to amend the program and see if we can provide some flexibility. Um, Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia had met with us. He is interested in looking at ways to improve that program along with the um, community um, uh, air protection program to provide some flexibility for uh, air districts, specifically Sacramento. And um, we've been having initial conversations with uh, San Diego as well. So that's what we're gonna be sort of working on over the next legislative process. So um, let's go to the next slide. And I'm just gonna give you a real high level stuff. You guys have this in your packet. 1.5 billion in one time to advance the electric school buses in um, an effort between education and air pollution. You, you heard a little bit about that effort earlier on the board meeting. 
You've got 600 million in one time GGRF to support zero emission trucks, buses, and off-road equipment. You had 76 million in one time GGRF to support low income consumer purchases through clean cars for all and other equity programs. And then this was a, a, a big issue. A lot of uh, legislators, staff, and um, governors folks talked about this. It, you know, and I've heard this from you know the district as well. The infrastructure isn't there to meet those goals. So, um, and and I believe based on where we're going to be budget wise next year, this is going to continue to be a priority for the legislature. And that was the 30, uh, 383 million for one time federal funds. There was a, a bit of a match to the ZEB charging infrastructure programs. And I know that, um, you know, we've got these, these goals uh, for, you know, 100% electric vehicles by, I think it's 2045. We're, uh, you know, we need to work harder in the infrastructure piece of that. Let's go to the next slide. So AB 617, the Community Air Protection Program, we had 300 million um, and 260 in GGRF and 40 million in general fund. We had um, 300 million in general fund for 23, 24 on a one-time basis for the CAP program. And then, um, third, you know, this is kind of, but we call anything lower than I think 50 million budget dust. Uh, but I, I wanted to put this out there because you know, there's an effort by the state to provide mobile air monitoring throughout the state. So the 30 million that was allocated to the community air monitoring, which is essentially mobile air monitoring, is going to pretty much uh, cover about 70% of the state. Now, how this happens is that there's an RFP process that goes before CARB, um, and we're hearing that that'll be um, issued uh, early next year because they want to get this money out the door. The um, and then of course the hundred million for methane satellite detection. That we're hearing the implementation of that is going to be a little bit um, delayed because of the technology, but we should see that over the next uh, two to five years. And then lastly, um, if you go to the next slide. We talked about this quite a bit today, wildfire response and mitigation. You, you are likely going to see an increase, uh, increased commitment from the um, legislature and the governor's office and possibly um, the uh, federal government on the you know, drastic increase in wildfires. We talked a lot about the um, mosquito fire uh, under this context. So the, that uh, 1.2 billion over the two years goes to resilient forests and landscapes, that's replanting trees, expanding grazing, utilizing uh, prescribed fires. Then you've got wildfire fuel uh, breaks, that's 260 million to support the break projects that will allow local governments to develop their own um, fire uh, uh, safety projects. And then of course the 5 million for community hardening. Again, these issues, I. You know, they're, they're one-time funds that are going to be appropriated over the next fiscal year, um, but we're hearing that this is going to be a continual, um, you, know, bud, you know, budget priority as we go through the next um, two to five years in the uh, state legislature. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll kick it back over to Jaime. Great, thank you. And thank you, Amy and Arc Strategies for the work that you do with us. Um, you know, you give us a lot of work to do as we're as you track uh, the legislative bills and funding, and then uh, we kick that work over back to you as we're reaching out to our legislators to advocate for that funding. And as a part of that, uh, thank you for your efforts as well with um, Assemblymember McCarty, who was just on the line, and three million dollars for mobility hubs within his district. So, so thank you for that. Um, so what this funding means is that we are we are waiting to see how it trickles down through the California Air Resources Board. We know already what the the categories are, but whether this is going to be a solicitation or whether this is going to be like the Carl Moyer through a, an equation process that that gets divided through through California. Um, but the four agencies, uh, our agency, SMUD, SACRT, and SACOG, we're ready for this. 
And so we've developed the Sacramento Region Zero Carbon Transportation Initiative that, um, that many of you have already seen and we'll be presenting on this also next month in October. Um, so th that is for the larger projects throughout our region. And at the same time, we are looking at smaller projects because we do not want to let our smaller organizations and nonprofit orgs uh, get left behind. We want to make sure that they take advantage of the incentives. So we're looking at organizations like the California Auto Museum that's looking to electrify. And as a part of that, maybe even put together a project of an EV lowrider. And so, uh, so th those are exciting projects. Uh, we have organizations like Cap City, that's a co-working facility where, or sorry, co-working shared facility uh, in, in Oak Park. And then we also have a lot of climate, res climate resiliency projects that we're looking at uh, as well. And so uh, we are ready, we are all aligned, we're leveraging each other's expertise and, um, and resources and funding as well. And so um, I will leave it there to see if there's any questions, but the next presentation uh, will be by um, our program manager, Rafe Porter, who will then talk about how, the, how this funding and the funding that we currently have uh, will, be, um, uh, will be put out as part of a solicitation uh, coming in November. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lemus. Uh, why don't I, let's, uh, if it's okay, um, if we hold our questions till the end, or Mr. Lloyd, did you, did you want to take your question now? I, I can wait, Chair. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's go ahead and finish, finish the, the presentation of the next item, and then we'll go ahead and, uh, and do the questions. Thanks. Good morning, Chair Gatta, members of the board, uh, Rafe Porter, Program Manager of Transportation and Climate Change. Um, happy to Happy to be here with you this morning. Um, if we could just go ahead and advance to the next slide. So as Jaime alluded to, um, we do have an upcoming solicitation um, targeting the fall of, of 22, so either the end of October or early November. Uh, and this is really to start to take advantage of some of the, the funds that um, Amy described that the state is, is handing out. Um, we have a roughly $18 million that can be used in this solicitation. And much like solicitations in the past, um, we are gonna focus on a, on a few areas. We've got um, a chunk of money for on-road trucks and buses, um, and that does not include school buses, and I'll get to that uh, shortly. We've got off-road equipment like ag and construction equipment, um, infrastructure support, so um, charging infrastructure as well as hydrogen fueling stations. Uh, and then the funds that we're gonna be using for this, um, as, as Amy already alluded to, um, we have our Community Air Protection or CAP funds, Moyer, Farmer, which is that um, off-road focus, and then uh, DMV. Next slide, please. So in this round, um, it's going to be a little bit different from the things we've done in the past. Uh, we are going to have a competitive solicitation. We've got some ranking considerations that I'll get to shortly. Uh, but we are going to prioritize a few uh, different areas. We're going to continue our focus on zero emission and trying to move our region more towards zero emission in the light, medium, and heavy duty space. Uh, we're going to continue our focus as well on disadvantaged communities and make sure that these areas that have been under-resourced uh, continue to have that. And that's both on the infrastructure as well as the vehicle side. Uh, and then this year, there's also going to be a focus on smaller fleets. Um, the state, I think, is describing this as, as um, any fleet with 50 vehicles or less, which seems relatively large, but there are much larger fleets out there as well. Um, in the past, we have had some focus on community-based organizations and nonprofits, um, and we'll continue to have that focus. And then again, focus on, on some of these smaller fleets, whether they be public or private. Uh, and then the, for the considerations on what we're going to be looking at, in addition to those priorities, um, we are going to be looking at and, and giving um, ranking to um, any projects that come in in our AB 617 um, community, which is in that Florence, South Sacramento area. We're going to be looking at projects and scoring projects that benefit disadvantaged communities, so they don't necessarily have to be located within them, but if they can show that they are benefiting them, whether it's um, use of the vehicles in those areas or providing infrastructure nearby for use. Um, we will count that as well. Um, we have location points for located within the AB 1390, which is a state designated low income area as well. Uh, and then last year we added, and we're gonna continue with this idea of um, ranking projects that have community support. So we're gonna be looking for letters of support, 
or any other form of support that they can show through the community, um, we will be providing uh, points for that. Um, and then something a little bit newer this year is we're looking for complete applications. We, in the past, we've been a little lenient on, on providing um, some additional assistance to applications that are quite ready, um, whether that's the application itself or the project isn't quite shovel ready. This year, um, just based on, on demand that we've had over the last few years, we're gonna be a little bit more stringent and looking for those complete applications. Uh, next slide, please. So moving forward, um, the next step for us is to, to start to outreach to the community and find out, you know, let them know that these, these are happening and kind of start to get a sense of what projects might become down the pipe. So on October 20th, we do have our first workshop that we're going to be holding um, to educate uh, individuals. And we'll send that information out to you if you have anyone that might be folk, um, interested in attending that. And then we will have some a few more focused workshops. And a lot of this might start to be to get at those smaller fleets and the community-based organizations, which will be a priority this year. Um, earlier, I mentioned that we're not gonna be doing school bus funding as part of this round. We're gonna be holding off on that until the, the spring timeframe. Um, we, wanna, we wanna approach school bus funding a little bit differently than we have in the past. We wanna make sure that we're doing it a little bit smarter and that we're working really with the OEMs. One of the big issues we've had on school bus funding is just the delay in getting those school buses delivered. And so we just want to approach this a little bit smarter. Um, we're also waiting for a little bit of guidance from ARB on, from the state on this. So that's why we're holding off on that. Um, not mentioned on this slide, but we're also not going to be um, including lawn and garden. Um, we did get some additional funds from, from the Air Resources Board from this. And again, we're waiting for some guideline changes on that. So in the spring time frame, we will have a school bus funding and lawn and garden funding as well. Um, the other thing that we're doing a little bit different um, from here on out is this is going to be an open solicitation. So we've done, um, you know, large solicitations usually in the spring or fall and try to get everyone to come to the table and, and put in a proposal. Um, while we will continue to, to, to advertise and, and educate on our funding and our incentives, we are just going to leave the solicitation open from here on out. Um, we've noticed in the past that the um, you know, throughout the year, we get great proposals for use of our funds, and we've usually had to tell them, sounds great, you know, wait until the fall time frame to be able to submit your application. Um, I think, you know, from now on, we're going to leave that um, solicitation open so we can um, entertain those great projects throughout the year. Um, we're also finding that, that funds become available throughout the year as well, whether it's projects drop out from our previous um solicitations or new funds become available. So we do, do wanna leave the solicitation open for those great projects. Um, so that concludes uh, my presentation. Happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Porter. There are questions from the members here. And I wanted to again say, I appreciate all the hard work of drawing down these state and federal dollars. Uh, all of those go to local contractors and business owners in our area to, and the, the best byproduct is we get cleaner air. So thank you for that. Uh, let me uh, bring it over here. I think we have questions from board member Lilloe, and then I, I, Madam Clerk, don't let me forget uh, uh, to ask to see if there's public comment. Board member Lilloe. Uh Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I know with the excessive heat that we had, there were some issues with uh, charging electric vehicles. Um, is there a um, a plan or a number or a, a policy of what it takes to make sure that if there is another heat wave like that, um, that, you know, owners of uh, electric vehicles are not kind of caught off guard where they're being asked not to charge your car <laughs> to, to drive around. So I was wondering, you know, um, what's, what's the future looking? Um, obviously that, that requires a lot of infrastructure investment. And then um, with um, the report that was just um, introduced um, regarding charging stations, has the city uh, identified um, um, companies that they prefer or they can connect them to different districts so we can have that dialogue about charging stations within the district? And um, there was a comment made uh, within the last previous um, um, slides that there's certain money that's being allocated to disadvantaged communities. Um, if I can get a little bit more explanation on that. 
and also um, focusing on small fleet vehicles um, for private. Again, if I can get a little bit of explanation on that, I would greatly appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Board Member Lulowi. Um, let me bring this over to our staff, uh, Jaime and uh, and and uh, Ray. A great question, Director Lolowi. I will take the first two and pass it on over to to uh, Mr. Porter for the last two. Um, yeah, the the grid and the resiliency of the grid is something that we are all very concerned about, and we are very fortunate to be working with a power utility like SMUD. And we are working with SMUD. Uh, we have conversations with them every single day, multiple times a day about the EVSD issue and the grid resiliency issue, right? Especially as we look at, at fires and, and other potential power outages. Um, there are opportunities and alternatives that we're looking at in the near future. Um, we're looking at vehicle to grid, um, power management. So this is where now we have our electric school buses that are potentially balancing power to the grid. So now we have the big giant batteries within school buses now that are supplementing the power now. So that is one opportunity that we are looking at. And Twin Rivers is, is a champion uh, throughout the nation into looking into that, that technology. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at with, with our partner SMUD is the opportunity with hydrogen. And, and hydrogen being used within their power plants in order to also um, be able to provide power uh, much, much cleaner than, than we are now. SMUD's um, zero carbon plan for 2030 uh, will be considering this. And so those are different alternatives that we're looking at. Um, but there's more to come on that. There is no, no real solution just yet, but we're, we're, we're trying to do as much as we can to, to find solutions for that. As can, far can I as, just put, are you going to your second to answer the second question? I was going to, Amy. Okay, can I just add something from a, a statewide perspective? You know, the the uh, Cal ISO in uh, previous years has attempted to regionalize the grid uh, between the Western states. Those efforts have fallen flat. But one of the ideas is to st strengthen, you know, your uh, electricity availability by banking, you know, sending wind and solar to Oregon, we take that, you know, their wind and solar during those flex times to help, you know, sustain uh, the grid so you don't have these, you know, rolling blackouts and flex times where you're not allowed, you know, that you're asked not to charge your car, which, which, by the way, was um, met with a, a little bit of um, uh, disdain when that announcement came out. Is is a regionalizing the grid a possibility in the near future? I I think it'll continue to be an issue. Assemblymember Holden, who's the chair of the Assembly Appropriations Committee, has wanted um, to do to do this over a number of years. Uh, you know, it, there's just a lot of unanswered questions about how that would work. Do I think it's a possibility in the future? Yes, but I, I, I think the only way that would be able to go through is if, you know, we, you know, there's significant heat waves and we just can't keep the lights on. It, it's got to be an act of desperation, I think. Yeah, members, I'm going to pass this over to the chair, the, the gavel over here, virtual gavel to uh, Supervisor Kennedy. Uh, I have a, uh, I've got to get to another engagement here, but to our vice chair, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Board Member Lilloy, for those questions. I think you still have two more uh, that Mr. Porter is also going to answer. Thank you, Mr. I, I think there was there was one more on um, EVSC companies, and so uh, we are working with many many EVSC companies um, now. Uh, we even have EVSC companies that are that are um, have are backed up by 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 private private funding who are now doing goodwill into our communities, and so. So there's a lot of opportunity for EVSC. And so we are working with, with the city of Sacramento, Sacramento County, and, and using the SMUD sustainable communities map to identify areas of need where EVSC should be located. One of the conversations I'm having with community members and underserved communities is, you know, the need for EVSC within those communities, right? And so then they tell me, they're like, Jaime, you know, how, how are we, you know, going to get, going to get behind uh, EV chargers when we don't own EVs, right? And so what one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm talking with them about 
is part of educating of, of getting the communities up to par with other communities that are already have EVSD. So that way, as we have programs like car share or clean cars for all, chargers are already within those communities. And as communities advance with EVSD deployment, the underserved communities don't get behind. And so that's a big effort that we're, we're doing with, uh, with our agency, with our partners, with City of Sacramento, uh, with, and with SMUD. Um, and then I'll pass it on over to Rafe to, to add or to answer the other two. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, so your first question, Director Lolo, is about the, the focus um, and emphasis on disadvantaged communities. And I think it gets to, to um, Jaime's point uh, there at the very end about, you know, just making sure that these communities continue to be um, yeah, a focus so that they don't become under-resourced as electric vehicles become more prominent, whether it's through um, ownership or through other programs like um, um, car share or community car share or um, even even opportunities through um, ride sharing like Uber and Lyft that are continuing to, to move into the electrification space that we don't leave those areas out. And so that's why there's that particular focus in these disadvantaged communities. And we are using the state definition of disadvantaged communities through um, Cal and Virescreen 3.0 and 4.0 um, for, for identifying those communities. And then specific on the small fleets, um, this, is, this is actually um, something from, from California Air Resources Board in this last round of funding um, that they um, do want a, a, an emphasis on small fleets. Um, they're leaving it up to the air districts on exactly how that's defined. Um, we are considering opening up our application to smaller fleets a little bit earlier so that they've got um, perhaps as many as 30 days prior to, to respond. Um, or we can, we can put in a, a scoring criteria. Um, we're kind of exploring um, both of those options. I think our main focus on, on the smaller fleets, however, is going to be on the education piece. It's really reaching out to those smaller fleets. It's reaching out to the community-based organizations and, and the nonprofits to just let them know that these incentives are available educate them on the benefits of, of owning and operating electric vehicles and, and really getting them into this space. Um, I think we'll use champions in, in this. We do have some um, smaller fleets like um, Community Resource Project and just more, more recently Habitat for Humanity have moved into the electrification space and we may, we may lean on them a little bit to also help us talk to some of these um, smaller organizations. So I hope that answers your question, um, Director Lilloy. Yes, and I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. As far as the application, you said you're going to have it available. In what format would it be available? Is it going to be on, online? Um, our, our offices are going to get a copy of the application so we can post it on our social media. What, what's the process? Yeah, um, we are moving to a fully electronic um, application uh, this year, and so we will have that available soon. However, we always do have just the old, <laughs> old school um, copies um, available for those that don't have access um, to, to the online version as well. And we will definitely, once that application is ready, we will definitely send it around. Great. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, do we have any other hands raised? I see none. No, we do not. Okay, is there any public comment? No, there's not. Okay. Uh, then moving on, is there any public comment in general? No, Vice Chair, there's not. Thank you. Uh, board ideas, comments, and AB1234 reports. Anything from the board? Okay, and with that, I want to point out that I just ran the fastest AQMD meeting in the history of the district. <laughs> so uh, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.